Yeah, give it up for Lisa. Good morning. morning. The Lord Christ be with you. My name is Eric Walker, and I'm a member here at Mayfield First United Methodist Church, and it's my honor to welcome each and every one of you here today. Um, We're so glad that you have joined us, and we also want to extend our welcome to uh, those of you who are listening on the radio on WYMC, and also those who have chosen to uh, watch us on Facebook this morning. Uh, If you happen to be watching on Facebook, please uh, make a comment in the comments section to let us know that you are with us. And also, if you happen to have a prayer request, you can post that in the comments section as well. Speaking of prayers, we're especially praying for those who have been affected by the tornadoes in Tennessee, tornado survivors from our area, Kate Cox, Hope Smith, Shelley Stone, the Reverend Selby Coomer, Carol Barnes, Shirley Kerr, Bruce Nedro, Mary Wright, Barry Robertson, Ruby Bennett, Shannon Easley Gerard, Rex and Beverly Smith, Shan Moore, Gerald Easley, Phyllis Walker, who's Buckley's mother, uh, Sally Brannon, who had cancer surgery this week, Wanda Gay, Beth Battles, Chuck Moore, John Poole, Sid Marino, Bob Cornman, Robert Ivey, Robert Conley, and Gordon Minsky. So please keep them in your prayers. Uh, we also want to lift up the United Methodist Churches in the Purchase District, and the candle on your right has been lit so that we could remember them this week in our thoughts and prayers. I uh, also want to remind everybody or let everybody know that in two weeks from today, we will have the dedication for house number two, and that is over at uh, 207 South 15th Street, and that will be also the day that we will do the pounding. So everybody bring a pound of something for the pantry. So please keep that uh, in your minds as well. I also want to quickly remind you, um, obviously you know that we didn't have our Valentine's dinner Friday night because we were concerned with the weather. Uh, So we are going to do that this Wednesday. So everybody who has signed up for uh, the Valentine's dinner, you're signed up for this Wednesday. Uh, Those of you who have a insert about the Wednesday night dinner, uh, please cross out the 21st. It's going to be the 28th when we will have pork chops, baked potato, salad, and dessert. So make note of that. And there is no charge for this Wednesday. Thank you very much. All right, on to our shout outs. First up, June Magnus, we love you and miss you and hope that you're doing well. Second shout out, city and county leaders, we thank you for your tireless dedication to our community. Your hard work is truly appreciated and we're grateful for everything that you do to make our city and county a better place for everyone. And our third shout out, Lisa Copeland. Let's, let's give her another round of applause. Yeah, we appreciate Lisa's incredible talent and dedication to come over here and, and serve as our church pianist. Uh, her beautiful music fills our hearts with joy and uplifts our spirits every week. Buckley wrote that. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, so thank you for sharing your gift. And as, as a son of a former church pianist, I know how much dedication and hard work uh, that goes into. So I also want to take this time to remind you that worship is what we do. Worship is an action verb. It's not something that we just watch. Together we're here to pray, glorify, and give thanks to God through Jesus Christ for all the benefits and blessing of our lives. Our prayer to open worship is found in the bulletin. It's also on the screen, so please read along with me. We sing and speak your praise, O God grateful for the many ways in which you have healed us. Keep our hearts, our minds, and our spirits open to learn ways in which we can offer healing love for others. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand as we sing our first hymn, O Spirit of the Living God.
Please join me in the prayer of illumination, which is found in your bulletin and also on the screens. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our first scripture reading today is from Psalm 86, verses 1 through 13. Incline your ear, O Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and needy. Preserve my life, for I am devoted to you. Save your servants who trust in you. You are my God. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for to you do I cry all day long. Gladden the soul of your servant, for to you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. For you, O Lord, are good and forgiving, abounding in steadfast love to all who call on you. Give ear, O Lord, to my prayer. Listen to my cry of supplication. In the day of my trouble, I call on you, for you will answer me. There is none like you among the gods, O Lord, nor are there any works like yours. All the nations you have made shall come and bow down before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. For you are great and do wondrous things. You alone are God. Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Give me an undivided heart to revere your name. I give thanks to you, O Lord, my God, with my whole heart, and I will glorify your name forever. For great is your steadfast love toward me, You have delivered my soul from the depths of Sheol. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Good morning. Blessings to you on this first Sunday of Advent. Or not Advent, I'm in the wrong season. On the first uh, first Sunday of Lent. I read somewhere the other day, and this, this was actually this last couple days, we get lost because our liturgical years go by so fast, doesn't it? Doesn't it feel like we just were in the season of Advent, we were just see, in the season of what we call ordinary time, and then all of a sudden we are in the season of Lent. And we get so rushed, don't we? And I'm guilty, as you can just see, I am guilty of that rush. Don't, and that's not my, I know that's my last name. And I know people always joked when I was a kid that I'm rushing around. But now this is a time for us to still, to still our presence and to still our hearts and to recognize that that rushing around can get in the way. And in this season of Lent, I, I want us to still our hearts And to be present with God. Be present with him and be present where we recognize where we may struggle. And I recognize I struggled with rushing. So may we go to God in prayer and lay our hearts down in this moment. Lord, as we come to you today, recognizing this season of Lent in our preparation for the coming days in preparation for the cross. Many times we recognize we can get in that way. Our world and our turmoil And us rushing around stands in that gap where you already are. 
Allow us to move. Allow us to be still. And allow us to let go. So that we may truly experience you in this season of Lent. That we may truly experience your love. The foolish love. That we are called to experience and live. As we let go, as we experience you, may we truly live out as you call us to live, to live towards you and to experience the grace and love as we experience the love from you. We recognize that there's many hurts and burdens and struggles in the world. We raise many and all of those that are in our hearts that we see around us, that we watch each day. Be with the wars, the, the struggles, the fighting around us in the world and even in our families may your peace your everlasting peace be present be with us as we forgive when we forgive those who have harmed us allow us to release the harm because you have released us from our harm. Lord, we thank you for this love. And we thank you for your grace when we fail. And we thank you to hold us up in your name. And as we remember the prayer you taught us to pray, we say, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, for deliver us from evil, for our eyes the kingdom and the power in the glory forever. Amen. Let's stand once again as we sing, I stand amazed in the presence.
It's now time to go to giving of our tithes and offering. I'll remind you that our tithe, our giving boxes are up front and in the back. You're welcome to give before or after service. We also, you may also give to the office or to uh, PayPal as well, and that's on our website. Let's go to God in prayer. Lord, we thank you for each day that we have. We thank you for the gifts of each day, and we thank you for the gifts you bestow upon us. I ask in this time that you bless the giver and bless these gifts that they go forth into your ministry and to this community and the world around us. In your name, amen. Please remain standing for our gospel lesson from the book of Matthew, chapter 18, verses 21 through 35. Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, if my brother or sister sins against me, how often should I forgive him? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you, seventy-seven times times. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him, and as he should not pay, he could not pay. The Lord ordered him to be sold, together with his wife and children, and all his possessions, and a payment to be made. So the slave fell to his knees before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii and seized him by the throat, and said, Pay what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. But he refused. Then he went and threw him into prison until he would pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw, slave saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed. And they went and reported to the Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that your debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have mercy, had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his Lord handled him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please remain standing as we sing the first verse of Precious Name.
So blessings to the first Sunday of Lent. What was that, Buckley? Oh, Adrian, yeah. Just going to rub it in, aren't you? We're going to start a new sermon series that walks us through this season of Lent. And each of these weeks, I want us to challenge different parts of our walk of faith. And this whole aspect and the whole point of this sermon series is the foolish love. I want us to be challenged to live foolishly in love. And each part will kind of build on top of each other so we truly experience the foolish love that God had and has for us. And this first week is about forgiveness. Forgiveness. And oh man, oh man, is forgiveness hard as we truly experience even in the text today. So how would and how do we understand forgiveness? How do we understand forgiveness? Well, it's easier to forgive one thing or another, isn't it? Do you, anybody have issues with forgiveness in their life with somebody that maybe has harmed them? Mm, I know I've had some. And Peter was trying to find out what does it mean to forgive? Oh, pious Peter, oh, pious Peter. He just was trying to find what it means of how many times to forgive. He just wanted a number so he could meet that, couldn't he? He says, you are the Christ, but don't you go to the cross? And this is when they were transfigured. We just came through the story in the lectionary And in this chapter, Peter once again wanted to find the precise answer. Is there anybody that wants just just wants the facts? Just give me the answer so I can live up to that, so I know I can check that box off, and I did exactly what I was called to do. Sometimes I get like that too. Peter's question calls Jesus Lord. The first thing Peter does is say, Lord, how many times must I forgive my brother or sister in the church? How many times? Just give me a number so I can know I met that expectation that you have for me. He understands human nature very well. You know, Christians need forgiveness. We need to be often repeated forgiveness For multiple offenses, because so often we fail over and over and over and over again. Oftentimes, we repeat that again. We need forgiveness. He he is eager to apply what Jesus had just talked about in the verses 15 through 20 about forgiveness. He is willing to double and then the normal Jewish understanding of forgiveness. Jesus, uh, Peter was willing to do that. You know, in the day that they lived, the rabbis, they, they recommended, based on the verses in the Amos, in the chapter 1 and 2, about God reckoning, revoking punishment, was three offenses, but not four. Only three. Limiting forgiveness to three times. The limit was three times. Peter was being generous in that time, seeking seven. Lord, will seven times do? If I forgive seven times, will I meet the expectation? This is a very pious question. But it is very imprecise, isn't it, as we find out? What is imprecise about it is because Jesus says, I do not say you seven times, but 77 times seven. Now, why this number? 
and we can pull the numbers numerology out and really try to find out but that doesn't matter that doesn't matter Jesus doubled plus one which means that it is a continual forgiveness an expectation that we always forgive there is no checklist on the refrigerator of how many times we have forgiven our brother or sister or anybody in Christ or even the world around us there's no check mark we just keep forgiving we don't we burn that list and just keep going so the central theme of forgiveness is a gift it is the gift that we give to our brother and sister and the world around us forgiveness understanding in the greek is the free gift of releasing it's for a way to give anyone who forgives another who has been harmed is engaging in this gracious gift we are participating in this gracious gift now forgiveness is a costly gift isn't it since the one forgive who forgives cancels the debt they were owed we have canceled the debt we have given away what they whatever who or whatever happened or the harm that they had done is canceled and we have given of ourselves. There's no responsibility. There is no liability. There is no deficit. It is all given away. God's forgiveness of our sins involves the forgiveness of God taken away, taken upon our sins, upon himself. He took that penalty for us. He bore them on the cross. Where forgiveness pervades a relationship, that it is no longer dominated by the aggressive charges, counterclaims, and illegalistic attempts to recover damages. We don't recover anything, we give away. It is the divine forgiveness. And we talked about this divine forgiveness in our prayer. We just said it. In the Lord's Prayer, forgive our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. We say it every Sunday. So, the question is, why do we still hold on to the harm in our life? Why do we struggle so often in our daily walk when we hold on to the harm. Each of us, have, I'm sure, have had a moment, maybe as short or as long, that we have held on to the harm that someone else has done to us. And we talk about that harm in this scripture. The slave that was just forgiven all the debts that he had been and he had begged his Lord to forgive goes right out the door and says to the fellow slave, let me read that again, who owed him a hundred denarii and was seized him by the throat and said, pay what you owe. And that fellow slave begged him for that forgiveness that he had just been given. When his fellow slave saw all this, his all his community was distressed by what he had just did. So, as we are forgiven, we are also to, call, to be called to fully forgive others. We must be willing to act upon that release, to act upon the release in our life of the harm that someone else may have done to us. We must be willing to stop counting if we are willing to count as a released slave did, have we truly forgive? If we are still counting the harms, have we truly forgive? 
have we truly lived the life of forgiveness. The forgiveness at hand is beyond calculation and beyond imagination. It is foolish forgiveness. Foolish forgiveness. It is foolish because it goes against everything we believe in the world. Whatever the world is, the debts you pay and you take away, you owe it back. But to forgive as Christ has forgiven, the same way that we are called is to live foolishly. N.T. Wright writes this. He writes about a story. He said, my wife and I once had a long conversation with a student who found herself incapable of feeling God's love. She wanted to know what God's love the way her friends said they did but it wasn't happening for her. Eventually, as we talked about her life, it came out that she had this distrust and frustration and hate, deep hatred for her parents. She resented the sort of people they were and the way they treated her. She had closed her heart, and they were where they should have been open for the readiness of God's love. There was a steel wall. Forgiveness is a two-way street, as N.T. Wright says. That wall prevented her from experiencing God's love the way she was called because she shared that same frustration towards her parents. That's what the text is saying, what Jesus is talking to us about today. So how do we release that harm we recognize the harm may be there some point in our life. How do we release it? I read this by a Presbyterian minister, and Presbyterian church is okay. You're good. <laughs> I'm thankful they came at, on Ash Wednesday. It was a blessed Wednesday, Ash Wednesday. If you weren't able to be there, you missed out. But it's recorded, so you're still welcome to. It was a good day. Marjorie Thompson writes this, to forgive is to make a conscious choice to release a person who has wounded us from the sentence of our own judgment. However justified that judgment is, it, it represents a choice to leave beyond our own resentment, our own desire for retribution, however fair such punishment may be. Now, this is important. She says forgiveness is, involves excusing the person from the punitive consequences they deserve because of their behavior. The behavior remains condemned. The behavior remains condemned, but the offender is released from its effects, from our own frustrations. Forgiveness means the power of the original wounds is not trapped in our own brokenness. So when we hold on to the harm someone may have done to us, what do we feel? We feel angerness, anger, brokenness, distress, frustration. And as what N.T. and Wright said, a burdened heart. And when we finally release that person or that harm, we experience love. We experience openness. We experience reconciliation. We experience newness. And this is what John Wesley would say is grace upon grace so that grace that loving grace is given and it goes forward and on and on grace upon grace now this is jesus trying to get us to understand that this grace that we give to others is the same grace he has given and this is the reason why. 
In the 70, now the 70 times 7, in the book of Daniel, the prophet wrote this, praying that Jerusalem be forgiven. That takes 70, week, 70 weeks of years. In other words, 70 times 7 years. Before the transgression, sin, and find that inequity, that sin is dealt with. And this is the ancient law of the Jubilee year. This lays down that 49 years, 70 times 7, all debts are remitted and everybody is forgiven. All slaves are released. Everybody starts on the same page. Everybody is the same, new, and set free. Well, Jesus has announced then and now that he is the jubilee year. He is that jubilee given to us. So why must we not hold that back? We are not to inflict, to inflict any more harm into the world, and that forgiveness is given to us as he has already given to us. Uh, each other. So the practice of forgiveness is the willingness to do things for one another so that the communion is restored. So our life of communion and our relationships are restored. In that same year, the Jubilee, everyone is restored to the same. And when we recognize that our life of Christ in forgiveness, we are restored. We are restored in our justified faith with Christ and God. Now, I was thinking back, and I was thinking about this foolish forgiveness. And the first thing I can think about is the many years that I worked with juvenile offenders, and I worked with this uh, many families through the years of working with juvenile justice. And I think of the many times I worked with families, and I worked with, I remember working in community, and one thing that I heard all the time is, I don't know how you can do it. I don't know how you can walk into those houses and experience the harm of those families and then you know what people would say? I ha would have a hard time forgiving if someone did that to me. How do you walk in there and how do you understand to be present with them when I would have trouble forgiving? And I would say all the time, they're people too. And it's hard to forgive, but God has forgiven us. People are people, and we harm each other, unfortunately. In that harm, we, have, we are forgiven, and we are called to release that forgiveness. Release that harm. Now, that harm is still there. It still exists. But in the re reconciliation and that love, we release that harm from inside ourselves. And we start to rebuild and become one with each other again. And I recognize that when families truly release the harm and they saw each other start to get better, they became one again. Those were the good cases. Those were the joyful times when we could walk into a family meeting that we called and and we saw true grace, the foolish love lived out. The foolish love lived out. But that was not many times, to be honest with you. There was many times there was still the held burden of frustration and harm. And the many generations oftentimes that that burden and harm was held on and passed on. So our challenge today in this season of Lent is don't hold on to those burdens. 
Don't hold on to those times of harm and frustration. When someone pulls, pulls out in front of you on the way out of church, don't get mad at them and do something that you're not supposed to do. <laughs> Live foolishly, forgiving all those around us. Yes, harm exists. Yes, our world is filled with many harms and frustrations. But we may live foolishly loving as we have been called to by Christ each day. So look for those times that you can live foolishly, to foolishly forgive. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Let's stand as we sing our last hymn, Precious Name. <laughs> May you go forth with the knowledge of the forgiveness of Christ in your life now. May you live continually this day and every day to foolishly love your neighbor as you have been foolishly loved as well. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>